morning. All right, so we are live with Alicia Parlopiano. Um, she is in Boston. Uh, we are in Korea um, at the Seoul Editors Lab. Um, it is a media hackathon about election coverage, and uh, she is going to share um, some of her insights from the New York Times. So take it away. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, like Sarah said, I'm a member of the graphics department at the New York Times. And we're a team of about 40 journalists who create all of the charts, maps, and visual stories for the newspaper and for nytimes.com. Um, and I'm based in Washington, DC, actually. And usually uh, I cover politics, but with a whole other group of people who work on our election stuff. Um, so a lot of the examples that I'll show today are are my colleagues work as well as mine. So I'm going to share um, some slides with you. Here. Um, and talk a little bit about election maps and some things I've kind of uh, learned over the past couple uh, US election cycles at the New York Times. So the first thing I want to say about election maps is that I don't think that there is one perfect kind. There are a lot of different ways to display election results, and they each accomplish different goals. So when we set out to make a map or any type of graphic, we always think about what the primary message is that we want to communicate, and then select the form that does that the best. So that said, we don't just make one map for election night. We make several. And I think that gives readers a much fuller picture of the results. So these are some of the goals that good election maps accomplish. There's accessibility, which is, can I find a particular place easily? Can I quickly determine the result in the place where I live? Uh, there's fairness. Are states or regions or districts represented fairly and accurately based on the number of people that live there or the number of electors that they have in those places? And context. Are important geographic trends revealed? How does this election compare to previous ones? How did the candidates do in places where the race was the closest? Um, so most of the time, good visualizations and maps require trade-offs. It's really hard to find a form that does all of these things really well. And so I'll give you some examples. Oops. Go back. So this is one type of election map that the New York Times has been using since at least 1896. Um, it's this map of the United States that is shaded to show which candidates won each state. And it's really great for quickly and accurately reporting election results because it's really accessible. Um, it's an iconic design and, you know, it's been around for a really long time. It's based on a geography that most Americans are really familiar with. And so it's really easy for people to quickly locate a specific place, like the state where they live, um, and see who won there. So this is our results map from the election this past November. Um, places where Donald Trump won are shaded red. Places where Hillary Clinton won are shaded blue. And then the dark red states are the ones that had voted for Barack Obama in 2012, but they flipped to vote for Trump in 2016. So the online version of this map is even more accessible um, than the maps on the previous slide because, as you can see, it allows you to zoom in on smaller election districts, um, like counties here in the U.S., and quickly see who the winner was. And then we also have a bar chart at the top that allows you to quickly see what the overall result was to know who actually won the election. Uh, we published a similar map of New York City on the night of New York State's primary election last April. And so we were able to pull in live results from even smaller election districts. Um, they're called precincts, and um, they're sometimes just as small as a city block. And so New Yorkers could easily find out how their own neighborhood voted um, and, and how the people, you know, just within a few blocks from them would have voted. So this view shows the Democratic primary between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. And so you can see that um, these small areas contain just a couple hundred of voters each, you know, 105, 50, 121, 100, 108. It's a really small level of detail for an election map. And then this one shows the Republican primary view. And New York is a very Democratic city. And so you can see that in some of these blocks in Brooklyn, 
only one or two people participated in the Republican primary. So it really, um, it really illustrates, uh, you know, an individual's vote in some of these cases, just because not that many people voted in the Republican primary in New York City. So um, my colleague Wilson collected some of the tweets by New Yorkers who were sharing images of this map that night, and these are some of the observations people had. So in the first one, someone found the Republican primary results in two of the blocks where Trump owns property, and um, could see you know what the result was basically like in the buildings that he owned almost. Um, on the second one, on the on the top on the right. Um, someone was the only person to vote in the Republican primary on his block, and so he found his one vote on the table. Um, the third one in the bottom left, um, they pointed out how well Bernie Sanders did in a particularly hipster young neighborhood in Brooklyn. Um, and the last one, someone who found his vote, um, found his block on the map, said that uh, his vote had never felt more real. And I think that's a really cool... Um, illustration of you know the power of a data visualization that people can relate to and connect with on a personal level. So this classic type of shaded election map is really good for accessibility, finding a certain place, and for quickly communicating results. What it is not great at is representing the results in a way that is proportional to how many people voted for each candidate and how much electoral weight or importance that each state carries. So the U.S. election system assigns what are called electoral votes to each state based on its population. And candidates need 270 electoral votes to win. So if I want to know how important a state is to winning the presidency, I can't just compare how much space it takes up with another state because its value is in its electoral votes, not in its size. So Montana, which is kind of towards the upper left of the map, it looks like kind of a big face on the, on the left side of it, um, it's 14 times bigger than Massachusetts, which is all the way on the east coast on the right. Um, be, but it has a very small population. It only has three electoral votes, while Massachusetts has 11. And so there's like this disproportionate amount of area um, to the number of people that actually live there. And because a lot of Democrats live in small area states on the coasts and a lot of Republicans live in large area states in the middle of the country, recent U.S. election maps especially always look a lot more red than blue, even though the country is more evenly divided. So my colleague Tim did a great conceptual piece after the election illustrating this very point. So he made two different maps that imagined what the United States would look like geographically if it only was made up of the areas that voted for Trump or only the areas that voted for Clinton. So you can see that in Trump's America, um, it takes up most of the land area, but it has kind of these eroded coastlines and little inland lakes and little holes that represent the places where Democrats live. And then Clinton's America is just the opposite. Um, it's basically a nation of islands where big cities, college towns, Native American reservations and areas with black and Hispanic majorities are. So in one of the quirks of our election system, Hillary Clinton actually won almost 3 million more votes than Donald Trump. Um, so while the land area, you know, shown here is very small, there were more voters in those places than in the very first map showing Trump's America. So the traditional shaded state maps are not great for giving small areas with large populations uh, fair and accurate representation. Um, so there are a few other election map forms that we use to try to solve this problem. So this is a proportional circle map. Um, it takes each county and places a circle on top of it, sized by the raw margin of votes that one candidate has over another. And so here, while there are a lot of counties with a red Republican lead, you can see how Hillary Clinton won the popular vote because she racked up significant, you know, number of blue margins um, in big cities, and they, um, you know, added up to be more than these small red circles. Um, so this map gives a more accurate portrait of what the, you know, population is and where people actually live in the U.S. Um, but the results aren't actually as accessible. 
because in some states it's really hard to tell whether the blue circles add up to more votes than the red, so you actually can't tell who won the state overall by just looking at this map. Um, another popular option is the cartogram, so it's the map on the bottom here. Uh, this example is actually from the 2012 election because we didn't end up making one in 2016, but each state is made up of little squares that represent their electoral votes. And so the squares are still roughly positioned um, you know, where they actually are in the United States, um, but they are sized differently because they're proportional to how many people and how much electoral weight each state has. So uh, when you compare the cartogram at the bottom to that traditional shaded map at the top, you can see how underrepresented the blue states are in the traditional map. Um, but the problem, again, with the cartogram is that it's also not very accessible. Even if I'm really familiar with US geography, it can be hard to locate a particular state because they're not positioned or sized exactly like I'm used to seeing them. Um, but maps are not the only way that we present election results. And so sometimes a chart will accomplish a goal better than a map will. So here is an example of a chart we did this year, or sorry, in last November. Um, the blue boxes here represent the states won by Clinton, and then the red boxes are the states won by Trump. And I've zoomed in here on the bottom section so you can see that the width of the boxes represents their margin of victory. So the widest states at the bottom are the ones that voted very Democratic or very Republican. And the height of the boxes represents the number of electoral votes that each state has. So you can see that Clinton's win in California gave her the same number of votes as about eight other states that Trump won just as easily. You know, Tennessee, Nebraska, Arkansas, Alabama. Um, you know, he he won all of those, you know, pretty handily, just like Clinton won California, but California is such a populous state that it was worth just as much to her to just win that one. And here I've zoomed in on the top section of the chart and you can see the really narrow boxes represent states where the vote was very close. And so you can see that Trump crossed that 270 threshold, which is what you need to win um, by winning a handful of states really closely, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Um, and this chart was actually published before we even had all the results. We ended up with 306 electoral votes in the end. Um, but besides giving a snapshot of the results, this chart also shows how valuable each state is to the candidates total. And another goal finally, that we set to accomplish with election maps is providing important context for the data and revealing trends to our readers. So, so in general, maps are good at revealing trends that are geographic. So when you look at this map, you can see that most of the states in the middle of America voted for Trump, and most of the West Coast and states in the Northeast voted for Clinton. Um, it also provides a little historical context because it shows um, which states flipped from 2012 to 2016 with that um, dark red kind of um, striping. Um, but it doesn't reveal a lot of trends beyond that. So another view we had on the results pages, which shows the change in vote from each county from the 2012 to 2016 election. And this map reveals that Trump improved the Republican vote in large swaths of the country, even in states that ultimately voted for Hillary Clinton. You know, you see in Illinois or um, in uh you know, what other states went for Clinton, they can see. Even in California, in Northern California, you can see um, that it became redder um, and, and people voted more for Trump than they did for Mitt Romney in 2012. Um, but if you watch the previous map or this map fill in over the course of election night, one important piece of context you'd be missing is how the candidates were doing in the states that really mattered. Um, you don't know which ones were expected to be close, which ones we kind of already knew which way they were gonna go when you're just looking at this map. And that's why we also publish this view of election results along with our maps in, it's a table that we call the big board. So the states are, are, are organized into these five columns based on how close the race is expected to be. So the states on the left are expected to go easily for Hillary Clinton, and the ones on the right were expected to go easily for Trump. And so one of them, you know, when, as the night goes on, when one of them wins one of those states, you know it's not very significant. It's something we expected to happen. 
But you know, as more results come in, the table allows us to focus on those states in the middle and be able to see if anything unexpected is happening or if one candidate is winning a large number of those close races. So I'm only on number two, but the first one was, was my longest point. Um, the second key to good election maps is simplicity of design. So there was an article in the New York Times a couple years ago about a training program um, for Apple employees in which they compared Apple's design philosophy to that of Picasso, um, just in the way that the company strives for simplicity and minimalism in its products. So this graphic appeared with the piece. It shows four images from Picasso's series of bowl lithographs and it compares them to how the design of the Apple mouse has changed and simplified over time. So that approach of kind of removing all of the extra details and only leaving the essential elements is also key for visually communicating data in charts and in maps. So the data ink ratio is basically the amount of data or information in your graphic or your map compared with how much ink you use to create it or you know, online, how many pixels you use to create it. And so the goal is to keep that ratio really high, to communicate as much information as you can with as little ink or as few design elements as possible. And everything on the page should be serving a purpose that is not just decoration. And so this GIF um, is from a company called Dark Horse Analytics, and it kind of illustrates what I mean. So you can see this you know, chart with lots of clutter, um, a lot of decoration, a lot of extra labels, and and how it improves when you keep removing. So it's quite a big difference and it really kind of illustrates my point that removing anything that's not essential is gonna make for a more effective um, and easier to understand graphic. So number three, um, I told you that they would get a little bit shorter. Um, provide analysis and annotation. Election results data is widely available, right? It's, it's public data, um, it's likely going to be reported by every news organization in your country. And so providing a layer of analysis over your maps is something that you can do to add value and give readers a reason to get the information from you and not from somewhere else. So this is that New York City Democratic primary map that I showed before. Um, you can see on the left uh, here there are filters for isolating parts of the city based on their demographics. So as you click on each of them, you get a sense of not only where the candidates won, but which demographic groups helped them win. So you can see, you know, which candidates won in the more heavily Hispanic or Asian areas of the city. Um, and this is an example of an annotation layer that was built in ahead of time. We didn't need to know the result of the election um, to know that at least most of these filters would be interesting and that, um, you know, we'd, we'd want to use them to help explain what happened. Um, so whether some type of analysis that you can prepare ahead of time, like what I just showed, a lot of your analysis is going to depend on the stories that actually emerge from the data and the actual result of the election. Um, for our presidential election in November, we did a lot of research ahead of time. We became familiar with demographic trends and what the polls predicted and the political geography of the United States, um, but none of us expected Trump to win. So. This piece wasn't started until about 10 p.m. on election night. Um, and as we started to figure out what the story was, that Trump won by shifting a large swath of the country toward him, especially in places where a lot of working class white voters lived and where Barack Obama won in 2012 in the Midwest. Um, you know, we had already collected all this data that we used to filter the map. So as the story emerged from the night, we were able to put everything together and write the analysis. This is another piece of analysis done by some of my colleagues and published a couple of days after the election. So it wasn't quite the night of, it took a little more time to, to piece together. Um, and this shows the counties that we 
called landslide counties, which is basically counties that voted for a Democrat or Republican by 20 percentage points or more. So you can see how the number of counties that have voted strongly for one party or the other um, has increased significantly since the 90s as our country has become more polarized politically. Um, and this analysis uses charts um, to represent the counties and put them on all these different spectrums to um, kind of reveal demographic trends in these heavily Republican or heavily Democratic areas. And so on to number four, um, take advantage of print. Over the past 10 years, the New York Times has shifted a lot of its focus to its online products like many other newspapers. Um, even though our print readers are some of our most loyal subscribers and print advertising still generates a lot of revenue, we still, you know, we get millions of views on our website on election night. And so that's where most of our focus is, um, you know, on the night of the election. People want information as quickly as possible. Um, you know, but the early editions of the paper have to be done by 9 or 10 p.m. before the results have even come in. And so the web is kind of like the place for election results. But that being said, there are things that print can offer that the web can't, and we try to take advantage of that as much as we can. So this is an election map that we published in print a week before the election actually occurred. Um, it was intended more as a preview it showed the results from the 2012 election and explained where Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump would need to do well to win. Um, and this map spanned four pages of the newspaper. It was kind of like a big fold out section. Um, it was massive. It was uh, one of the biggest maps that we've ever printed, if not the biggest. Um, the smallest election district that is usually reported um, across the United States as the county, which I've showed you some county maps um, just before this. Um, but we used a company with access to, you know, individual voter data to help us model, well, they modeled the results um, at the zip code level, which is an even smaller um, area in each state, in each county in the US. Um, and just to give you a sense of context um, of scale, there are about 3,000 counties in the United States, but there are about 43,000 zip code areas. And so that's how detailed this map ended up being. Um, so let me just kind of show you what I mean. Um, here are the 2012 results at the county level for the state of Oklahoma. You can see that there's a little variation around some of the bigger cities, but every county still voted Republican. <laughs> Um, and we use a different color scale for the zip code map, but you can really see how much more detailed this map is. Um, and breaking out the counties into their smaller pieces reveals a really interesting trend, um, which is at the very centers of Oklahoma City and Tulsa, the, the bigger cities in, in the state, um, voted more Democratic. And they they it's something that you don't see on the county level map because the Republican votes in other parts of those counties kind of eclipse them. And so this shows some more nuanced detail than, than the other map did. So if you looked at this map online, or if you're seeing it on your screen right now, you know, it, it would take a lot of zooming in and out to get all the great detail that the print version gives you. And so it's it's a good way that we were able to take advantage of print. Here's another print graphic of those New York City primary results that I showed earlier. And um, another great thing about the print version is here you're able to see both the Democratic and Republican maps side by side. The Republican one we have smaller here, the red one on the left, um, just because, like I said before, its primary had a lot fewer people voting in it, so it was less important to our readers. But, you know, we have we're able to annotate right on the map in print. You can give analysis and connect it to a specific place um, in a cleaner way than you can necessarily do online. Um, here's another example of a print graphic. This is a big spread that we ran in the paper two days after the election. And I've all already showed you some of these maps um, in, the, in the first part of the talk. And the print version is so great because it allows you to see all of them at once and it gives you a fuller picture of what happened than just one of these maps provides on its own. So finally, number five, um, the last point I just want to make about election maps is that it's really important to prioritize the phone and the mobile experience. Um, most of the traffic we get on our results pages on election night, I think about two thirds, 
was for mobile, um, people on their phones or on their iPads. And so it just doesn't make sense to spend most of our time designing these big, beautiful results maps for the desktop computer when most people will see the version that is just you know a couple of inches wide on their phone. So principles for designing election maps for the phone are essentially the same. Um, they're just smaller size constraints. So this is what the main results page look like. It has most of the primary yeah. elements of the desktop version, but they are reorganized to fit in the space. So you're still able to zoom in and move the map around, but instead of boxes that pop up when you roll over a county, the information is fixed to the bottom of the screen so it doesn't cover up the entire map. You can see it changing down there at the bottom. And we have the same filters for the different map views and the big results board is there too. But instead of trying to line up those columns, those five columns side by side, we put the key states at the top, the closest races that you wanna look at, you know, that are important to know who's gonna win. And then we give information for all the states below. So those are my five thoughts on election maps. Um, thank you so much for, for listening. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, we can see it. Good. good? OK, cool. cool. Uh, round of applause for Alicia. Right. So do you have time for a couple questions, if we have any, from our audience? Sure. Yeah. All right. Does anyone have any questions? Anything you're dying to ask? Come on up. So do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm Dr. Kyung Hwang, and I work at US1, uh, US agency. Mm -hmm. Question in Korean. So you can ask in Korean and then she'll, yeah. So, she, so we'll have, there'll just be a two-step process because there's a, we'll have an interpreter. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's happening. So, so, hi, can you hear me? <laughs> you can use the, use the microphone. Can you hear me? Okay. So when you're making these election maps, um, uh, basically I think making the map is important, but what's more important to is make sure that this map is widespread so a lot of people actually view this and use this. So when you're developing these types of products, do you begin by defining your target audience to you know how many people you want to reach, or do you first make it and then see what the feedback or the response is like from your potential audience, which, which do you take? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think we have a general sense of the types of people that come to the New York Times on election night. Many times it's, it's, a, it's our biggest, you know, one of our biggest traffic nights, if not the biggest night um, of the year. And so we get a lot of people who are not normal subscribers. We get a lot of people who don't off, always read the New York Times. And so this is kind of our chance to try to appeal to a really broad audience, um, all ages, you know, all demographics, um, people who don't normally read the paper and hope that we can um, get them to stick around and to get them to um, subscribe and, and to become more regular readers. But it's definitely a broader and bigger audience than we're used to. And so we try to to make it as accessible and understandable for you know people not just all across the country, but even across the world who are interested in our elections. Great. Anyone else? Anything you're dying to know? Last chance. All right. I think that's it. So thank, thank you very you so much. much again. Yeah, and, great. Uh, and uh, have have a good night. Yeah, and have a good <laughs> rest of your day. <laughs> Bye. Bye.